Okay, welcome everyone to the April 9th edition of the VCAP BCD uh, series on the V Brown Bag podcast. We have Thomas Brown, who is going to be presenting this evening. And just to run down some of the notes about the podcast, you can join in on the conversation on V Brown Bag by using the V Brown Bag hashtag on Twitter. And you can also follow along with our other series, Asia Pacific, every other Thursday, 9 p.m. New Zealand Standard Time, EMEA, Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Um, Greenwich Mean Time, Latin America, every Thursday at 7 p.m. Pacific Time, and, of course, the U.S. Podcast, which we're listening to right now, Wednesdays at 7.30 Central Standard Time. If you want to download this recording or any other of our previous sessions, you can get it from iTunes by searching for professional VMware brown bags or using that bit.ly link on the screen right now. And you can also go to the feed burner link to see most of our recordings if you want to do an RSS feed. Again, our presenter this evening is Thomas Brown. You can follow him at, at Tom Brown on Twitter. And my name is Trevor Roberts, Jr. You can follow me on at VM Trooper. I'll be monitoring the question window as well as the Twitter hashtag uh, traffic to see if anybody has any questions there. Okay, so without any further ado, uh, Thomas, you ready to take over? Yes, yeah. sounds good. Okay, let's see. Go ahead and make you the presenter. Okay, you should have control of the screen now. All right. Let me know when you can see my PowerPoint that I have up. Yep, I can see it. All right. Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome to the V Brown Bag. Um, like Trevor said, uh, tonight we're covering the VCAP DZD, and this is uh, sections five and six. Um, I'll be adding on to the sessions that Adam and Brian did the past couple of weeks. Um, so, so, like Trevor said, I'm Thomas Brown uh, from Raleigh. I'm a mobility architect at Vero. If you're not familiar with Vero, we're um, a VMware, Citrix, EMC, Cisco VAR, and the Carolinas in Southern Virginia. Um, I've got a couple of certifications there. Um, you can find me on Twitter at Tom Brown and my website thomas-brown.com. I just launched that a couple of weeks ago, so uh, there's some more com content coming. And uh, lastly, um, thanks V Brown back for having me. I'm happy to be here. So, um, tonight, like we said, we're covering sections five and six. Uh, you can see an outline here. Uh, basically, uh, what I'm trying to do is to go by the, the blueprint of the exam for these two sections. Um, we'll talk a little bit about each objective. And um, feel free to, to ask questions in the GoToMeeting or on Twitter. And Trevor, just feel free to jump in if, if anything comes up. Will do. So, uh, objective 5.1, we're going to talk about creating a physical design for the view infrastructure storage. The infrastructure is, of course, the vCenter, the connection servers, security server, composer, things like that. So, um, uh, throughout this, this presentation, I've thrown some links for references that, that you'll be able to find uh, where I got some of the information. So, um, the first thing is talking about sizing the events and composer database. Um, Andre Libovici, uh, myvirtualcloud.net, I'm sure you guys are familiar with his website. If you're not, you should be. Um, is a great resource for view design, um, and I'll be linking him throughout, throughout this presentation. But um, in his, what's interesting is that VMware doesn't actually give um, sizing guidelines for the Composer and Events database um, in official documentation that I can find. Um, so I actually linked Andre's blog here, and it seems to be um, pretty in line with what, what I found from, from personal experience as well as other view experts. So uh, the Composer database should never get above 5 gigs. Um, it generally just doesn't have that much data in it. Um, the events will depend on activity of the desktops and how many desktops you have in the environment. So if maybe they don't get refreshed very often, um, or if they do get refreshed very often, you can vary from 1 to 2.5 megabytes per desktop 
per month. That's kind of an estimate. So that gives you a, an idea of how big those databases are going to get. So um, the, the storage requirements for the transfer server, unfortunately the transfer server is um, listed in the blueprint of this exam. Um, I'm going to say later in the presentation, I'm going to go ahead and say it now, nobody uses the transfer server. I, I don't know why they keep wanting to quiz you on it, but it is in the blueprint, so we've got to talk about it a little bit. Um, if you're not familiar with what the transfer server does, it allows you to um, basically download VMs and check them out so that you could take them offline and go do offline things with those, with those VMs. What those offline things are, I, I, I've, I've yet to find out. Uh, I, I haven't seen a great use case for the transfer server. So, And I actually noticed in the View 6 announcement today that they're actually sunsetting the transfer server, thankfully. Um, but since what that's really doing is allowing you to download and check out a VM, it makes sense that the re repository is a, equivalent to the size of the, of the VMs that you're checking out, basically. Um, and then the storage requirements for the server infrastructure. vCenter, follow the best practices for whatever version of vCenter you're using. Uh, you'll find that there are KB articles for each version of vCenter that'll tell you how much, uh, you know, all the hardware requirements for that version of vCenter. As far as the view servers, uh, connection and security, um, it's usually whatever you typically use for Windows. The connection and security as a composers don't take very much disk space at all. So whatever you typically size for Windows plus updates is, is fine. Most environments from what I've seen is that's about around 40 gigs. Um, but the view documentation actually does say 40 gigs required, 60 gigs recommended. But um, again, whatever you typically do for Windows, these take a very minimal space. So before we jump into a little bit of the, the storage for the desktops, let's do a quick review of link clones for anybody that may not be familiar with them. So um, anytime you create a pool of link clones, um, basically you have your master VM and vCenter will create a full clone of that master VM and create this replica. Uh, and then each of your clones are actually linked back to that replica disk. So keep that in mind as we go through the next couple of slides because we're going to talk about these replicas and these clones, where to put which parts and things like that. So as long as you've got a, a decent understanding of how this works, that basically the master image is cloned to a replica and then each of the link clones reference that replica. And each of those link clones are really just um, just a delta disk that basically as a user logs in, any writes happen to that link clone, but the read-only data such as the operating system and things like that are really on the replica. So those link clones are generally very small depending on how much data your, your users generate and how often you refresh those. And we'll talk about that in a little bit too. So given, given that review of link clones, let's jump into the pool storage. So um, determining the base image or template requirements, depending on if you're using link clones or full clones. So that, that VM is usually Windows plus updates plus whatever apps you include in that VM. That'll vary de depending on which, how many apps you, de you deploy. It'll vary depending on which version of Windows you're using in that VM. So I typically just tell people, build a VM, include whatever apps you want, and we'll um, give me that size and we'll size out your data stores from there. So what I typically see is somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 gigabytes thin provision, 40 gigabytes thick, but obviously that varies depending on environment. So the uh, replica requirements. Like we just said in that previous slide, the replica disk ends up being basically a full clone of the master VM. So uh, approximately that much space um, for however many replicas you have. How many replicas you have depends on um, how many pools you have. You ha you're going to have at least one replica per pool and depending on how your data stores are configured you may have multiple replicas per pool. We'll talk about that in a second too. Um, but you want to leave enough room for 
at least two replicas per pool if you're using a dedicated replica data store. And the reason why I say at least two replicas per pool, um, think about at some point you're going to have to re recompose that pool. And so during that recompose operation, you're going to temporarily have two replicas. So I've seen scenarios where people didn't size the replica data store appropriately, and then they go to try to recompose their pool of desktops, and the, the replica clone fails because they don't have enough room on the data store. So you always want to have at least enough room so that you can recompose that pool. So the linked clone requirements. Um, VMware has a document here that has um, some of their their sizing gu guidelines. If, uh, if you can you see my web browser, Trevor? Um, so yeah. I don't know if you guys. Are, yeah. Okay. Perfect. Um, so it, VMware's documentation gives some rough estimates for how much space you're going to need for the link clones, um, but that really depends on how much data your users write. So remember what I said a, a minute ago that um, those those link clones are basically just dis are basically just um, small disks that are used for writing data. So it, let's say um, when your user logs when the VM powers on actually. Windows creates a paging file. By default, that's equal to the amount of RAM. So think about it. your link clone is going to at least be the size of a paging file. And then, um, depending on how much memory is in that VM, you've also got a swap file there. So right out the bat, if you're, say for example, you're using 4 gigs per, per clone, um, you're looking at at least 8 gigs right there because you've got a paging file plus swap file. And then, um, once the user logs in, their Windows profile is going to be written to that same disk. Um, any data they create, like Word documents, Excel documents, etc., are going to be written to that disk. So um, that one that one varies a lot. So and then also, as that link clone disk grows, um, that data that it disk keeps getting larger. But at some point, you're going to end up refreshing that VM or recomposing that. So that disk will shrink back. Um, all that data that the user has created will will go away. Um, hopefully, you're using persona management or something like that to save all that data that the user created. But um, you'll notice uh, we reference Andre Leibovici's calculator here in a little bit, and he actually um, there's one option to specify how often your um, how much your disk will grow before being refreshed. So in most scenarios. Um, link clones are refreshed at log off and with that in mind um, your link clones never grow that much since you're refreshing them pretty much every day so that one's that one's a little bit tricky to nail down an exact number but um, Andre's calculator if you put in all the uh, if you put in all the um, information he's asking for can give you some great guidelines for that Um, so, uh, like we said here, determining the amount of data growth that depends on how often the VMs are refreshed and how much data your users create. So, all right. So, continuing on with the physical design for view storage, uh, the persistent disks. Persistent disk um, is basic was basically the the only way to save the user profiles. Um, on link clones prior to persona management being created. Um, so persistent disk is basically a second VMDK that you can attach to each VM and the user profile gets written there. So that persistent disk is basically equal to the size of that user profile, however much data they have. Um, I'm not a fan of them at all. They cause way more headaches than they're actually useful. So don't use them. If if we're talking real world design, not the not the exam here, they're irrelevant. Don't use them. Um, in the for the for the exam, just know that it's basically um, equal to the amount of user data. Um, instead of persona, instead of persistent disk, use persona management or third party utility like Profile Unity or AppSense or something like that. Uh, the disposable disk. That is. Um, that is a 
a VMDK that is attached to the VM is optional as well that you can direct the paging file and temp files of each VM to that disk. So the benefit of this is that um, as soon as Windows powers on, right, uh, it creates that paging file. You can tell View to redirect that paging file to this disposable disk. So therefore, um, when the VM powers on, that paging file goes to the disposable disk, your OS disk, um, your base link clone disk, it does not automatically expand. Um, it gets directed to this disposable disk that is already pre-provisioned for however um, big you need it to be. I usually recommend a one, one and a half times the paging file. And the reason one and a half times is it needs to be at least equal to the paging file, but then also um, have enough room for temp files as well. So the uh, full clone requirements. Um, the biggest use case for full clones that I see is when people need dedicated VMs to install their own apps. Uh, maybe like developers are a good use case for that. Most of my work is done with um, floating link clones. Um, so in my opinion the full clones are kind of a minority but um, I know that in other environments ever, they use all full clones. So it's just something that depends on the environment. But as far as sizing that, it's um, it truly is a full clone of that master VM template. So your template times however many VMs you have, that's how much space you need for full clones. As you can imagine, that eats through capacity pretty quickly. So um, that's one of the reasons why I don't recommend full clones. Yes, capacity storage is cheap, but um, if I can save some money on having, having on being able to buy less storage, then I'm going to do that and use link clones. So uh, sizing the persona repository, um, we, we usually estimate five gigs per user uh, to start off, but you need to keep an eye on that and adjust it depending on how much data your users have. So um, if you've got one user that really needs all of their MP3s in their view desktop for some reason, <laughs> they're obviously going to have more than five gigs. But some of your some of your other users may not have as much, but that's a good starting point. So um, and is also a good guideline of one persona management server per thousand users. If you need to go above thousand a thousand users, um, use something like a DFS namespace to distribute that load across multiple persona servers. So the physical design for the application storage. This one is, is kind of tough to estimate because every environment's applications are different. Um, so, you know, some environments may only need Office, some environments may need a ton of apps. So you need to define, before you ever start a view, a view project, you need to define what apps you need and which users need which apps that helps you size um, how much storage you're going to need for the clones as well as um, your applications. Maybe they're thin apps or maybe they're um, installed in the master VM. So how do you find that information? Um, so that's usually uh, VDI assessment tools like something like Liquidware Labs Stratosphere Fit or um, Lakeside Software has another good tool that does that and those can actually um, install agents on physical PCs and report back and tell you um, which apps they have installed, which apps are actually being used, and that helps you kind of create that list of, okay, the accounting users need these apps, and HR users need those apps, and that helps you define your use cases for your view environment. And then you get into how do I deploy these apps to these VMs? Well, that depends, again, on the type of app. Um, you've got a couple different options there. You could you could thin app that application. Um, if it's not a good candidate for thin app, you could natively install it into the master VM. Um, those are usually the two big uh, the two big use cases there for apps. But I know that there are some other options like um, uh, Liquidware Labs Flex App, and um, I know like Cloud Volumes can present apps through VMDKs. AppSense can layer apps on top of desktops. Or not AppSense, Unidesk can layer apps on top of desktops. There's a lot of options there. 
um, as far as the, the exam is concerned, thin app and natively installed apps are all you should be worried about though. Um, and how you determine which deployment method to use it depends on how complex that app is. If it's an application that's um, very tightly integrated with the operating system, um, like I use Adobe Acrobat as one example, um, as soon as you install Acrobat, it installs its PDF printer, it installs its right-click context menu, so you can right-click on a Word doc and create a PDF. Something with that many hooks into the operating system is not a good candidate for ThinApp. If you absolutely need Adobe Acrobat inside your view desktops, you're probably going to want to um, natively install that in the in the base VM. And so, do I choose if let's say I do have an app that's a good candidate for thin app? Do I stream it or do I full install it? Well, in my my opinion, that kind of depends on the size of the app. If it's a small application, like maybe you're wanting to um, thin app like FileZilla, like an FTP client or something like that. That's a pretty small thin app. Um, that'd be a great candidate to stream it across the network. Um, if you're not familiar with the thin app streaming versus deployed, um, basically the streaming functionality um, will present an icon into the desktop, um, but that's really just an icon sitting there. As soon as the user double clicks on that icon, it will stream the thin app from a network share. Uh, to the desktop and launch it immediately. So as you can imagine, if you have something that's a really big application like Office thin apt, um, it's going to take a while to copy Office across your network and launch it. So that's a use case where maybe you'd want, if you were to thin app Office, um, you'd probably want to deploy that into the desktop. And what that does is um, when the user logs in, uh, or depending on how you're doing it, being on how you're deploying it, um, the thin app will actually be installed into the desktop. Um, it still abides by the security um, groups that thin app follows, but um, the app is local on that desktop and will launch much faster, but you've got to wait on it to install. So there's pros and cons to both. So I usually tell, tell customers, depending on how big of that app is, stream it if possible. If it takes too long to stream it, and it's a good thin app, then maybe um, fully install it. Um, as far as the application capacity, again, it just it just depends on um, what kind of apps you're using. Um, like if you look in the VMware documentation, um, if you need if you have a whole lot of thin apps, you could use something like DFS again to distribute those thin apps across multiple servers. And there was a comment by Ray Olander that you can't thin app anything that installs a service, pretty much. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's another that's another tricky one. So, yeah, there's definitely um, good and bad candidates for thin apps. So, the performance requirements for physical storage design. This is always the fun part of the view design. <laughs> because uh, you start talking about um, expensive storage here. So if you could imagine um, a storage lifecycle of a desktop uh, throughout uh, the period of a day, um, when the user, f when the machine first boots, you know, Windows boots up, you might have several VMs booting at the same time. That's a whole lot of read I.O. Um, coming off of your storage for, to allow Windows to boot if you've got several VMs booting at the same time. Then 8 a.m. your users get on get on site and they all log in at the same time. That's a whole lot of both read and write, but mostly write because it's writing that user profile to the disk. So those boot storms um, make sizing performance storage pretty tricky because you've got to have enough IOPS there to be able to handle those boot storms, but you don't need that amount of uh, performance throughout the entire day because once those users get logged in, most desktops hover somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 IOPS per desktop. Again, depends on what they're doing, um, but that's kind of a, a rough average. And um, VMware actually has a, a document here, the, the storage considerations, where on page 8, VMware actually lists their numbers of average IOPS per desktop. As far as the the exam is concerned, 
VMware is going to look for those numbers in that document. If, they, if there's any type of a question about how many IOPS you need to estimate for a desktop, that's the number that they're looking for that's, on, um, that's in that documentation. Um, real world though, how do you, uh, how do you get this, um, these IOPS numbers? Well, again, something like um, Stratosphere Fit or something can reach out to those physical desktops before you virtualize them and figure out roughly how many IOPS each desktop is doing. Um, so that helps you size uh, approximately how many IOPS per desktop can I plan for. Maybe I've got some power users and they're more in the neighborhood of 25 IOPS per desktop. That, that could dramatically affect your design. So um, I, don't really, I don't really dive into how to calculate IOPS here um, because that's covered so many other places and frankly I wasn't sure we would have enough time. So um, I've listed uh, an article here by Duncan Epping, um, it's his Yellow Bricks website that has a great uh, explanation of how to calculate IOPS and um, the number of IOPS for different types of disks. Um, definitely check that out. If you guys have looked at Scott Lowe's Designing vSphere Infrastructure Pluralsight course, he does a great job of how to calculate IOPS as well. Um, outside of the exam in real world, Andre Lipovici's calculator, which um, is on his website, myvirtualcloud.net, um, has basically you can fill in all of the data that you need, and it will it will tell you about how many IOPS do I need to plan for uh, these view desktops, and that's pretty much the industry standard from what I've seen as far as sizing storage for view environments. I know um, Vero uses that pretty heavily and I've heard plenty of other people use the same thing. So uh, it's, it's a great tool. If, I would highly recommend you check that out if you haven't already. Um, the throughput and storage network requirements. Um, VMware doesn't actually touch on that much in their documentation and so even though it's on the blueprint I wouldn't worry about that quite as much as I would the IOPS. So um, usually, I mean, you, you've either got in most environments today we've got 10 gig throughput to our storage anyway. Because um, depends, obviously, it depends on your environment, but that's that's not really as much of an issue as IOPS typically in view environments, from what I've seen. So I didn't really touch on that as much. So um, let's talk about tiering for storage. Um, one of one of the my favorite parts of my job is when I go to a customer site and I start talking about all the um, all the IOPS that are going to need for their replica disks and um, for for their clones. And the first thing a customer tells me is, "Oh, our our, um, our storage array does auto tiering. We've got plenty of IOPS. It it'll it'll settle it out. Hey, don't worry about it." Um, yeah. It, I can see where you're going, but um, desktop store uh, desktop storage workloads are very different from storage from server storage workloads, and I say that because servers are mostly static; they're doing the same thing all day every day. Desktops are very random. You may have users that, um, it, of course, everybody's going to have the login storm at, in the morning. But throughout the day, you've got some users that are just sitting there browsing the web. You've got other users that are creating documents or working hard all day. Um, so it's, it's very random. And so for that reason, I usually tell customers, disable any storage hardware tiering um, for your replica disks, if possible. And Vue actually gives you the ability to, um, to put your replicas on a different data store from your linked clones. And that's a great feature. Um, because that allows you to pin your replica LUN to the highest tier. So um, maybe you've, your storage array has SSDs, SAS disks, and SATA disks. You want to guarantee, find some way to guarantee that those replicas live on SSDs. And the reason for that is all of um, all of your users are reading from that replica disk. So you want as much I/O as possible coming off of that disk. So. Um, Typically, uh, what we what we do at Vero um, is we carve up 
uh, like a small RAID 5 group of SSDs since that gives you more capacity but um, and it doesn't take as many disks to get that capacity so um, you t there is a write penalty for RAID 5 but since those SSDs have so much I.O. it doesn't really matter that much um, and then for our link clones we usually do uh, RAID 10 since that produces the highest amount of IOPS for that for that RAID situation and gives us an, gives us enough capacity as well so um, just to recap there put your replicas on SSDs the link clones is not quite as important you definitely you don't want to leave them on SATA probably um, but again uh, in real world Andre's calculator is another is um, another great resource here to tell you how much IO you need for your actual link clones they don't need anywhere near as much as the replicas though generally so um, the establish the sizing for each storage tier in the design uh, so this is talking about how much capacity you need for each uh, each LUN basically so um, you typically do not want to put more than 140 link clones per VAI enabled VMFS LUN um, and the reason for that is the amount of SCSI commands written, written, written to that LUN um, is it can overload that one LUN if it doesn't have VAI enabled um, you do, do no more than 64 link clones per LUN NFS data store I've seen I can't find any um, official VMware do documentation for how many link clones to put on an NFS data store, but Andre actually uh, put on his blog a couple months ago when View 5.3 came out. He was saying 180 VMs per data store, but again, that depends. Um, if you're using something like Nutanix, where it's just one giant NFS data store uh, spread out across multiple hosts, there's not really a limit there because you're technically writing to multiple RAID groups. So um, NFS is a little is a little gray. Um, due to the fact that there uh, is a number of link clones per per LUN, this typically means that we end up call it, carving up several smaller LUNs as opposed to a few larger LUNs. So um, maybe you'll have 10 LUNs of 500 gigs um, as opposed to like five LUNs of uh, a terabyte, something like that. So uh, it, you just need to kind of figure out how much space it's going to take for the 140 VMs. That's how, that's how big a data store should be, and then repeat that for every set of 140. So um, in the, the view clients, uh, this, is, this is the fun part of view is figuring out all the client uh, client requirements because everyone seems like it's different um, you've got uh, you've got several different options for clients as well you've got zero clients which are basically just boxes running uh, firmware that has a view client built into it there's no operating system to manage there's no um, hard drive in those boxes I'm a huge fan of zero clients and I use those whenever possible just because it's less for the uh, the end user to it's less for the administrator to manage um, whereas if you put something like a thin client in place which is usually um, a box that's maybe running like a Linux OS or like wise has their own operating system or I think Dell has another one there's several different options there uh, it's still sort of a it's still sort of an operating system maybe you could call it like a fat firmware but it's still something that you end up having to manage um, and then of course you've always got the fat client which is basically just a physical PC with the Windows view client installed um, again you've got a you've got a copy of Windows sitting there that you have to manage you have to protect you have to put antivirus on etc so um, depending on what your needs are uh, there are several different options there. If um, I've seen customers use the like a physical PC with the Windows View client um, as sort of like a pseudo DR scenario. Let's say I'm at a remote office logged into a View desktop and my WAN link goes down. 
if I have a zero client, I'm basically just sitting there staring at a, a black screen. I can't do anything. But if I have a fat client, then I can at least minim minimize that view client and maybe open up a local web browser and do something else. So um, there's different different options for different scenarios there, and um, different clients support um, different different capabilities. Like um, some of them support uh, two-factor authentication, um, radius, and RSA secure ID. Um, and Sean just threw out a good a good point on Twitter that um, the Microsoft licensing uh, definitely impacts which which clients you use. I'll say, for example, if you've got a fat client, that's a copy of Windows sitting there that uh, that you need to have a license for. Although um, Microsoft does have a product called Thin PC. It is like uh, just a stripped down Windows 7 embedded. Um, as long as you have software assurance, you get Thin PC for free, and um, you could use Thin PC to image those uh, to basically basically image those desktops with Thin PC, load the view client, and then you've got kind of a pseudo thin slash fat client <laughs> there. But um, but yes, definitely check with your local Microsoft rep because we all know how friendly they are. So. Um, so take a look at the uh, security requirements that you have there. Um, maybe you do need RSA Secure ID. Maybe you do need Radius. Um, View actually supports both of those by default. By default, you can enable either one, um, and then it just shows up as an extra authentication challenge when you log into View. Um, with RSA Secure ID, you could enter in your um, your username and your little passcode from your token and then it'll ask you for Active Directory um, so it gives you some two-factor auth, auth authentication and um, another cool feature built into View that a lot of people don't really use is um, you can establish tags on different pools and different connection servers so um, let's say for example um, you've got a security server paired with a View connection server you can put a tag on that connection server called external and um, put a tag on every other connection server called internal well then as you create pools you could associate an internal or an external tag with that pool so what that allows you to do is let's say you've got um, I see this in healthcare occasionally where um, maybe they've got a pool of desktops that has some super secure applications or data that if I'm on site I'm allowed to access but I'm not able to access from home. So we'll actually associate that internal tag with the with the secure pool and even though I'm entitled to it both on-site and remote I can't log into that pool remotely. So um, that's something to think about if you guys have security requirements. Um, so the connectivity requirements for the view clients are they connecting internally or are they connecting externally? Um, that's something that um, would help you figure out how many connection servers, how many um, security servers, what your your network uh, requirements should be. Um, <laughs> yes, Cody. Uh, we unfortunately have some customers that uh, Cody just threw out a, a comment on Twitter saying if you have security requirements, um, we actually have some customers that. Uh, Security is not very high on their their concerns. <laughs> surprisingly, it's it's kind of funny, but um, uh, so the internal versus external, um, you you can use any of those client options internally or externally, but just make sure you consider um, the network link that they're on. Um, you don't want to connect to view over. Um, have several users connecting to view over um, like a home DSL connection or something like that. Just make sure you've got enough bandwidth there. The multimedia capabilities can also um, affect those bandwidth requirements. If a user needs really needs to stream music or stream video to to that client at a remote site, um, keep that in mind and design your network accor accordingly. Um, and then my favorite part, the uh, the peripherals. Everybody loves the USB devices. Um, so I see this a lot in financial customers 
Um, like I've got a lot of banking customers that they have receipt printers, they have check scanners, they have um, digital signature pads, they have all sorts of things. Um, make sure that all of those devices work with whichever clients you choose, of course, and make sure that you you consider the network latency for USB devices. If you're um, if you're using like a digital signature pad on a view client and your desktop is in some other site, that digital signature might be delayed depending on how much latency you have between that client and that desktop. Because you got to think about that USB um, command is going to the zero client or physical client, whatever, whatever you may be using, across your network to the desktop and then back to that client to display on the monitor. So um, you may have a little bit of latency there. So um, the session connectivity requirements, um, do, do your users need to roam around to different sites? I see this a lot in healthcare as well. Um, we do a lot, of, a lot of hospital view designs where nurses need to roam from one floor to the other and they need to make sure that their desktop session will follow them to a different floor. Um, keep in mind that uh, that may also change uh, how often your desktops get refreshed, when they get refreshed, if, they, if the users get disconnected from the desktop, um, just make sure that you take that into account. And uh, for, for roaming users, make sure you, you come up with a good printing strategy. And the link I've got here is actually a link to my blog. Um, it was a blog post I did a couple weeks ago talking about the various printer options that you have for view. Um, one, one feature that uh, we like to use a lot for roaming users is um, VMware View's location-based printing. And um, that's actually a really cool uh, utility that allows you to basically create rules to map certain printers. So you could say, if the view client is coming from um, this certain IP, IP address range, they get that printer. So um, a lot of times, like I'll go back to my hospital example, is the biggest place where we use this. Each floor of their building is a different subnet. And so we use location-based printing and say if they're on floor, the IP address for floor 3, then they'll get floor 3's printer. And uh, so that's kind of a, a neat feature. And it's printing seems to be one of the biggest headaches when people roam around. So make sure that you've got that strategy nailed down. Uh, remote access requirements, we touched on this a second ago, but um, the number of users that log in remotely um, will definitely affect your view pod design. Um, you may need to allocate more security servers and, and, and those are obviously connected to a connection server on the back end, so you may need to add more connection servers depending on how many users, uh, depending on how many users log in remotely. So definitely keep that in mind, and also the network requirements that we talked about a minute ago. So um, as far as the, the desktop session behavior requirements for disconnect, log off, timeout, that's usually driven by what the end users want and what the business needs. It's a, it's a, it's a back and forth battle. Um, but you definitely should define that up front because let's say, um, I've worked with customers where the users never ever log out, and um, we all know we all know those those users that they just they just hit that Windows key L to lock their screen and they go home. Um, if those desktops never get logged out, they never get refreshed, never get recomposed, never get updated, and so um, that those. Um, those different uh, disconnects, refreshes, log off timers that may affect the number of spare VMs you have in the pool which of course affects your CPU and RAM sizing for the cluster. So, and also more desktops equals more storage. So um, it's that one is a hard one to define but uh, you can play around with the different settings on the pool such as um, disconnect after or log off after X number of minutes of disconnect. Um, so if the user just, maybe they just close out of the view client, 
you can say if they've been disconnected from that session for an hour, then log them off. And so that way you can actually refresh and recompose that VM. Uh, the display protocol requirements. Um, basically your choice is between PC over IP or RDP and they are different pros and cons to both. Um, for example, uh, like I find that like USB devices um, and sound and multimedia work a lot better in PC over IP whereas RDP may, may work better in certain network scenarios. Uh, maybe if you're working with um, some really high latency or, um, or really low bandwidth uh, maybe you need to steer towards RDP versus PC over IP. But um, again, that just kind of depends on your use case. Um, as, as you design view environments, you'll find that a lot of it depends. <laughs> so so the, um, the management requirements for a view client design, um, again, that goes back to which type of client you use. Um, for zero clients, it's pretty easy. Um, like if they're, if they're running the Teradici firmware, you can use the Teradici management appliance to push out new firmwares to them, to push out settings to them. But other than that, there's not much that needs to happen. But if it's a fat client, um, you will need to, of course, keep keep it secure with Windows patches and antivirus updates. Um, I actually had a, a customer one time that um, I was trying to, I was installing a view environment for them and I was like, hey guys, have you checked out um, some of the Teradici Zero clients? And um, they're like, no, we don't, want, we don't want any thin clients. We actually, we used to have a Citrix environment, and all of our thin clients, um, they were Windows XP embedded, and so our antivirus wasn't supported on them. And so all of our thin clients got viruses, and they propagated throughout our network. So we don't want any any clients, and I had explained to them the difference between a zero client, a thin client, and eventually they were on board. But um, that's something to think about. You definitely need to, um, if if your client has an operating system, you definitely need to manage it as if it is a full PC. So because uh, things do go wrong, hard drives break, uh, you know, any number of things could go wrong with them. So the software distribution. Um, I felt like this was kind of an odd place in the blueprint. Um, I'm not sure why this was in the client design, but um, I from I think VMware is talking about the software distribution to the desktops, the actual virtual desktops here. Um, and so that depends on if you're using full clones versus link clones. Um, if you're using link clones and you need to distribute software to those desktops, um, you would just add, update the software on your master VM and recompose the pool. If you're pushing software to the full clones, um, then you could use any number of software deployment solutions uh, to those full clones. Um, you could use whatever you're using for your physical PCs. You could use something like Mirage uh, to layer applications on top of the operating system. Um, and then so the client peripheral requirements we talked a little bit about this a second ago if you have any um, if you have any client peripherals like USB devices um, and so if you have any USB devices or um, maybe you have sound or microphone requirements things like that um, those definitely can place constraints on which type of clients you use so definitely evaluate the different client options and um, once you have your requirements defined of course and uh, see see what you actually need to use there as far as the exam is concerned um, I think um, they're probably I think I think you probably need to place your focus more on the view client than um, than clients or um, zero clients uh, I think VMware Looking throughout the blueprint, it was mostly um, in the in the associated documentation. It was more based around um, the VMware View client for um, Windows and Mac. But um, as far as the uh, security requirements, again, two-factor authentication comes in here. Um, smart card authentication uh, or single sign-on, something like uh, Improvata One Sign, uh, could help out here. We do a lot in healthcare where. Um, we have a badge reader attached to the zero client and a nurse can just walk up and tap her badge 
and um, she's automatically logged in and taken to her Windows View desktop. So um, again, those Improvado is not in the blueprint, but smart cards definitely are. So if you're not familiar with that, you may want to review those a little bit to see how they work. Um, and just uh, so overall advice for this exam, this is a very storage heavy exam. I uh, definitely know um, definitely know how to calculate the, the storage. This is um, this is uh, this is I mean I can't stress that one enough. It's it's very storage heavy. Um, also know the max minimums. Oh. Yes. Sorry, Thomas. Real quick, uh, Kyle oh. had a question. Is kiosk mode on the blueprint for the VCAB BTD? I did not see that on the blueprint, and now and now that you mentioned that, um, I'm kind of surprised by that actually. I, I I do not think that was on the blueprint. I think it might be on the DTA, but it's not on the DTD. Thanks. Um, so definitely know the the view pod max and minimums, um, like number of desktops per pod, number of connection servers per pod. Um, the number of desktop in, in, to save you guys from looking that up. The number of desktops per pod is is 10,000 per per vCenter, um, and the connection servers you can have seven connection servers in one view pod. So um, definitely know that, uh, and and the rest of the pod maximum and minimums number of clusters per per uh, a number of hosts per cluster, and you'll notice actually a couple bullet points down. It's kind of important. Um, this this exam is based on view 5.0 and so you've got to you've got to shift back in your in your mind a little bit and uh, remember those maximums and minimums because they definitely change from 5.0 to 5.1 to 5.2 so um, 5.0 you can only have eight hosts per cluster for example so um, when you're when you're looking up documentation make sure you're looking up the numbers for view 5.0 so um, I listed some recommended reading there. Um, notice that there are a couple of storage sizing guides there. Um, and then the other one is the net network optimization guide. That talks about um, the uh, network requirements for PC over IP. And so um, that is also pretty important as well. Uh, make sure you know uh, how to calculate um, you know, how much how much bandwidth do you need for X number of PCIP connections? I also referenced um, Andre's VDI calculator here, like I referenced several times throughout the presentation. Uh, I used, in addition to using his calculator pretty much every day, um, when I was studying for this exam and I was trying to calculate a lot of that stuff myself, I actually used his calculator as a reference to kind of double check myself. Am I, am I close here? So um, definitely uh, take a look at that and see if you get the same results he got. Um, if you're not familiar with one of the design-based exams, um, go through the exam simulator and uh, make sure you get used to the drag-and-drop utility. Um, this exam is um, part multiple choice questions, part drag-and-drop just like the DCD, and part Visio style questions. Um, so you may have to drag-and-drop different components on the screen and connect them together. So make sure you're familiar with that um, Visio style tool. And um, that link there takes you to the VCAP DTD page. And down at the bottom right, they've got the exam simulator that you can try. And um, unlike, in my opinion, unlike the, the data center design, this blueprint actually aligns very well with the exam content. If you know the blueprint, you'll do very well on this exam. Um, so. With that said, uh, any any questions and um, uh, any any questions in the uh, the go to meeting, Trevor? No questions in the go to meeting right now. But guys, oh, there's a comment from Ray. Let's see what he had to say. Okay, so he had a comment about thin apps. Uh, thin apps result in extra disk space and IOPS. Or user use caching, whereas installing thick means all the binaries are kept in the replica and not cached by clients. So for a large office, a large app like Office, that can mean a big difference as far as your storage, um, storage sizing. Any comments on that? 
So um, if, I understand, if I understand the question, he's asking about um, stored he, performance he was, sizing he was for thin apps? Just making, yeah, he was just making a comment okay. about, you know, if your application is a certain size, it might be better to thin app it versus having it installed natively. Do you have, like, a threshold as far as size or, I don't know, uh, resource consumption where you decide whether something is re better to be thin apped or installed natively? Um, Usually, um, native versus thin app ends up being complexity of the app. Um, like I was saying earlier, if it's multiple operating, multiple hooks into the operating system, it ends up. Uh, I end up installing it natively. Um, if if it is a good candidate for thin app, size usually comes in determining if I want to stream the thin app or f do a full install of the thin app. Um, and there kind of depends on your tolerance, honestly. Um, Say if you've got like a uh, Microsoft Office 2010 thin apt is like two gigs. Um, if you want to stream that across your network um, and you want to wait for that to launch, then um, that's fine. Um, but most people don't want to wait for that, and so they end up um, doing a full install of that thin app. So. Yeah, and he was also talking about for those larger applications, then you have to deal with disk caching, so increased IOPS, extra disk space use, and all of that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, VMware doesn't really, uh, they don't really have any storage um, performance guidelines for persona shares or thin app shares just because of how many variables there are there, right? I mean, um, there's multiple applications there, so. Okay, and uh, Sean also makes a comment that thin apps can impact login time if deployed through a login script or a group policy or something like that. Definitely, yeah. Um, if you're, I assume, Sean, if you're talking about like ThinReg, uh, using ThinReg to register the application, um, yeah, it, it definitely can, depending on, like, if you've got a, a, a large number of Thin apps, it's going to take a little while for ThinReg to loop through and register each of those Thin apps in the, in the operating system. Okay, and this one uh, might be a bit challenging to, to answer, but with v6 just announced, how <laughs> long does uh, VMware expect the, the v5 exam to be around? Uh, I have I have not heard anything about um, a version five a version six exam yet. Um, I would let's see for the data center side. How long did it take for them to come out with the VCAP 5s after vSphere 5 came out? It was... I honestly don't remember. It was a while. Yeah, it was a while. <laughs> so I would plan on this exam being relevant for uh, at least another another year, if not beyond. I mean, you can still take the VCAP 4s, right? Um, so. I haven't tried the VCAP 4s, but it's possible. Yeah, yeah. No, I think those will phase out, actually, at least for but, the VTV okay. side. Okay. 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 Well, I would I would still plan on this exam being around for a little while. It, View six was announced today. They haven't even um, announced when it's going to be available for download. So, uh, and you've got to wait on the customer adoption to get up to speed on it. I don't see this exam going away anytime soon. It was just released a year ago. So. Right. Okay, and I just want to throw a plug in there for uh, VMworld is usually one of the best places to take the exam since there's usually a significant discount. So if you're on the fence about whether you want to try the exam or not, uh, I, I highly encourage folks to go ahead and take the exam if you're going to go to VMworld. Definitely, yeah. Okay, uh, any other questions, guys? If you'd like to ask Thomas live instead of having me relay your thoughts and hopefully uh, not butchering them too much, please go ahead and raise your hand and I can go ahead and unmute you and then you can speak live with Thomas. Okay, no questions coming in. Um, so Thomas, I apologize if you covered this before, but I, I wasn't sure if I heard it. Did, did you have like a, amount of time between when you did the v, VCP and taking the VCAP, like how long did it take you to prepare from going from the cert, the regular certified professional level to the advanced certified professional? That's a great question. Um, so let's see, I probably had, 
I would say I probably had about a year and a half worth of view experience before I got my VCP desktop. And then from going to the VCP desktop to data center design, um, I probably had six to eight months, I think. But that's be that's mostly because you know I work for a VAR and I design view environments every day. So um, if you're like an end user of a view or like a view, just a standard view administrator, you don't have quite as much design experience. There's definitely um, a little bit of a learning curve as far as um, all the storage configuration, like how to optimize that just right, um, and as far as all the maximum and minimums, I think that I think you could uh, definitely pick up those skills and read all that documentation in in a, in a few months there and um, be ready for that exam. It's I've I've taken both the VCAP data center design and desktop design, and I found the desktop design to be far easier than the data center design. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If that helps. <laughs> yeah, I took the data center design, and it was quite a marathon. So, guys, if you're taking either of the design exams, uh, whether it's cloud, data center, or desktop, make sure you pace yourself and make sure you um, get a good breakfast. <laughs> and um, yeah, you, you'll definitely start spacing out after a while if you're not focused. Yeah. Okay, so. I'm going to go ahead and wrap up the recording now. Uh, this recording will be available soon as we can post it on the RSS feeds, uh, iTunes, on professionalvmware.com. This was a great series, and it was a great way to end the session. Thomas, thank you so much for the amount of knowledge that you brought to this. I hope folks feel more empowered now to take the exam. So yeah, thank I you hope everyone. so too. Yeah, thank you, everyone. <laughs> and we're going to go ahead and uh, wrap up for the